What else did you say? <laughs> All right, Alpha. When did you first come to Avtex? I came here after finishing at VPI in 1941, June of 1941. And I was here a year, and then I got called into the service because I had a reserve commission. And I was in the service for four years and then came back here in 46. Your first time at Avtex, which department were you placed in? I was in the laboratory. Did you return to the laboratory? In the form of the laboratory, yes. It was the technical end of it. And then I wandered from job to job, many, many jobs. Could you talk a little bit about um, what some of the work entailed? Well, primarily in the first part, I was down in the laboratory working. In the second part, I spent a lot of time physical testing. Mr. Baldwin probably talked to you about that because he was head of it. And then I was out in the plant quite a bit. And then toward the latter years, I was in technical service. And we called on all the tire manufacturers and to see how our product was going and how much they needed and all that type of thing. And then in the latter years, I was technical superintendent of environment, which uh, working with EPA and those people. When you went to the different plants uh, to find out the product that they wanted, uh, could you talk a little bit about the product that we produced here? Well, we made rayon tire coin, and we had a plant in Lewistown that took a yarn that we made and converted it into tire fabric. Also, we sent a lot of the tire yarn to the various uh, rubber companies, Firestone, Goodrich, Goodyear, Cybernet, all, all of them you can think of, really. And we would go out from time to time to see how the, the yarn was uh, working for them. See if we had to make any changes and things like that. How was the yarn made for the tire cord? Do you know? I haven't heard anyone talk about what went into making tire cord yarn. Well, it was made from wood pulp, primarily. Originally it was cotton pulp, and now it had become wood pulp. And it was a high tenacity rayon, which was very different from the uh, yarn that was made originally as a textile yarn. Our plant at Lewistown made textile fiber. We were the largest and first uh, rayon plant to make tire yarn. Was the process different or the chemicals different? Well, it was basically the same, but you had modifications. Uh, I don't know how to say exactly what was different, but it was entirely different. Baths and the spinning baths, which had acid in them, zinc, and sodium sulfate, and things like that. When you moved up to the testing uh, lab, could you talk a little bit about what you were testing, how you did it? Well, Mr. Baldwin probably told you more than I will, but. There we measured the thickness of the yarn, the denier as we call it, which is the weight in grams of 9,000 meters of the yarn. And we measured the strength of it, the tensile strength, the elongation, and various factors like that. And we have what we call a fatigue test for tire yarn to have it stand up under flexing, which had a big influence on how it worked in the tires, of course. What type of instruments? Uh, Mr. Baldwin didn't really <coughs> go into detail about how the testing was done, the type of instruments, the type of testing that the materials went through? Well, they were special, what we call IP4 machines, I believe it was, but just, they broke the yarn. They had clamps at each end and broke the yarn, and you measured how much force it took to break it, and how much elongation the yarn went through before it broke. And they were all important factors in how it performed later on in, in the tires. And our Lewistown plant made some textile fiber, but they also had a converting operation. They took air yarn and made it in tire fabric, which was sold to the tire companies. As you visited the different tire companies, did they ask to have the product changed? Do you remember any evolutions? Well, there were a few modifications we made. Uh, we put what we call a finish on it, which is just helps lubricate the, the fiber. And we did that, and sometimes we changed the elongation and various things like that, just try to improve the performance. 
How long were you there at Avtex? <laughs> well, I can remember that very well because I graduated from college in 41. And so at the end of 41 years, I decided it's time to retire. I was 82 then, so except for my four years in the military, I was there for that many years. You weren't 82. So 82. You said I was 82. No, I said 90. Came in 41, I retired in 82, which is 41 years, which was 41 years was when I finished the BPI in 1941. <laughs> That's the way I could remember it, one of the few things. <laughs> what did you study at VPI? Chemical engineering. And I never really used a lot of the chemical engineering, but the learning at college came in handy, I'm sure. Were you recruited to come to Avtex? Well, that's real interesting. I'll tell you the story. American Viscos was a young company then, just getting started good. And the head of the chemical engineering department said this would be a good chance to get some interview experience. And I don't think you'd be interested because it's a new company. But it turned out they were very interested and they were paying one of the highest salaries at the time to incoming people. So. Uh, Sounded like a pretty good job, and I took it. Came me at the front row, which was just getting started. So when you arrived in 41, the plant was just up and running for about how long? Not that long. About a year and a half, I would guess, somewhere, somewhere in that neighborhood. You were there for 41 years. Could you think back a little bit about some of the stages of change or evolution of American viscose, just some of the... Well, I don't know how to tell you, but the original spinning was what we called box spinning. The yarn went down into a box where it spun around, the twist was put in as it was picked up in the box. In front of all, we put in a continuous machine. There it went from the spinning to the final product right away. It didn't have twist in it because it was a no way to twist it at that time. So later on it had to be twisted and all that. But uh, it was about a revolutionary way of making rayon at the time. High speed, double end, that type of thing. Did it seem, it was new almost when you got there, did it seem like, what did it seem like when you first started there? What were your impressions of the plant? It was a big plant. <laughs> I think we had 2,000 people are roughly. Did Mr. Baldwin say how many did he remember? Oh, 2,000 I think it was. And uh, it varied a little bit. But we made the tire yarn, we made staple fiber, and we made uh, various forms of what we call a light danger yarn. Some of them went to parachutes. And then we had a crimp fiber, uh, Avicron we called it. They had a special usage. And then we made some dyed yarns and things like that, all different varieties. Hmm, that's some information I haven't heard yet. Um, okay, let's see. We went through your education. Do you want to add anything about the plant at this point that stands out in your mind? Uh, was that the only job that you had? Aside from going to the war, was that your entire... Uh, I spent the rest of my time at American Visco, Abtex, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. I had different jobs out there, of course. Where did you come from originally before you moved here to Front Royal? Uh, I was born and raised in Lynchburg, Virginia. limited service, they decided I didn't have to go then, but it wasn't long before they called me back. In May, and we were going to be married in June. Could you talk a little? Do you want to say this part? No. Okay. No. Uh, you, uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was the, just doing it when you had it off. Uh, so no, the Army leave, called leave you him. up? The Army called you in and right. changed their minds and then... Well, uh, because I was limited service, they didn't have an assignment for me right then. 
So it wasn't long before they did bring me in. And this time I went to Reading, Pennsylvania. No, no. Fort Monroe. Fort Monroe. Well, Fort Monroe first. That's right. Then I applied and got to the engineers. See, when you, when, in those days when you went to tech, majority of people, three-fourths of the fellows, and they were fellows, who went to tech also took military and ROTC. Oh. Nowadays you can take it if you want and take it and leave it. And nowadays, of course, girls go. There was a skirt barn, they called the skirt barn up there then, a few girls. And uh, the major so many of the fellows took uh, agriculture. The, and the ones that didn't take ROTC, didn't they? Weren't they the ones that not usually were? Not necessarily. Not necessarily. Well, anyway, uh, it, was, it was a man's school and a military school. I mean, you took military on, usually. And so when he got out and graduated, he automatically had a commission. So then when he had a commission and then Pearl Harbor hit, he got called. But uh, it took him until he went in June and it took him till May the following. Just about this time, he got the call to come back in and he was stationed at uh, Fort Monroe. And you were supposed to get married to him? In June. In June. I was graduating in early June and uh, we were to be married the 20th. But he was already in then. Oh, dear. Didn't matter. We did. got married anyway. <laughs> Thank God you came back from the war. A long time. <laughs> he never went, really. He stayed. He never, because of his eyesight, he uh, got put in whatever he could do in this. And he and in uh, tech, you were in um, coast, coast artillery. artillery. And I decided with this job, I'd like to go into engineering. So I became a post engineer at Army. Reading Army Airfield in Pennsylvania. We stayed down Fort Monroe a year, and then by the following, uh, by the well, a little over a year, really, um, he got transferred, we'll say, because he applied for it into the uh, engineers, Air Force engineers, and then we got sent to Reading in the fall of '43. Yeah, '43. So, see, yeah, he basically, he stayed, and then he stayed in Reading for four years, all the rest of the war, until the war was over. So you never made it out of the United States no. during mm -hmm. the war? No. What, what were your duties uh, at Fort Reading as the engineer? Reading. Well, I was post-engineer. We took care of the airfield, maintenance, and all the property around there, and that type of thing. So you got to see your tire cord from Avtex in action. Well, I didn't think of it that way, but that's the way it was. <laughs> Can we talk a little bit more about um, what life was work, what life and work uh, was like at, at the plant? <laughs> well, there's a lot of mighty fine fellows working out there, I'll say that. And there was always activity going on. We stayed busy the whole time I was there. And, uh, How did Avtex fit into the scheme of other industries in the United States? Uh, weren't we a leader here in, uh, at the Front Royal Plant? Well, at the time the plant was built, it was the largest rayon manufacturer in the world. And uh, then uh, as we had other plants, but they didn't make tire yarn as such. So this was a tire yarn plant originally, but it ended up making polyester and making uh, staple free on staple fiber and various types of fibers and uh, I don't know you couldn't find a better bunch of people to work with I'll say that. Were you involved in uh, doing some of the lab work to try and change the fibers? Or oh yeah as technical superintendent I was in charge of the all the workers in the in the laboratory we had Edgar Baldwin talk to you about the physical testing where we check the fiber itself. And then we had the chemical labs to check the baths in which the yarn was spun and the finishes and that type of thing. Yeah, could you talk a little bit more about those, some of those different areas? Um, the chemical labs, the different type of labs? I don't think we've gotten that down yet. 
that well, the chemical labs primarily were testing the, the spin baths, the way you measured the uh, sulfuric acid, the zinc sulfate, and the sodium sulfate. And uh, then uh, you know, we had finishes we put on the yarn, so you had to analyze those and measure the amount on the fiber. And of course, later on in the operation, you probably talked to somebody. This acid bath had to go back to what we call reclaim, where it was built up again and recovered to, so it could be used over again. And then what was, wasn't used went to the waste treatment where the acid had to be neutralized and the, any solid settled out before it went to the river. Do you remember when they had the, the, the lab moved here that was working on creating new products? I don't remember what year it was, but uh, I can't think of the name of it now. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, research and development was moved here from Marcus Hook, and they did a lot of work with Aion as well as the other, the other plants. You Have you talked to Herb Welch? No, I haven't. He was with R&D, and he'd be a good one to talk to. Okay, thank you. Um, so you didn't oversee that lab that created the new products? No, no. We uh, we got them right away and we were the ones that had to make them work. <laughs> Get the bugs out, so to speak. So your area of expertise was um, the chemical baths and the testing lab? Well, that was what I was in charge of. Actually, the development of the tire yarn was more my field than uh, than the other. It was, the other was pretty much routine things, not too much new going on there. But you didn't get involved in the developing. I got involved in the development of the rayon uh, fiber itself in the various usages. Could you talk a little bit about that? Well, we had all different types we made at one time what we call a 300 denier yarn for parachutes and then we had a special fiber uh, which was when it split in water it crimped and that had a special usage and I think I said something about the 300 denier we made for parachutes and uh, and we had a fire re resistant yarn we made and uh, see, I don't remember I've got to look something there. Then a lot of the yarn went into belting, like your belts on your car, things like that. And the bicycle yarn, spun dyed yarn. There a lot of different types of yarn. How did you did you ha get a sense that um, at the at the point that you retired that the plant may be nearing the end of its uh, useful life? I wouldn't say in '82 there was too much indication of that. Uh, rayon had lost some of its popularity. Nylon and some of the other Decron had taken over some of the business. But as far as I knew, we were we were doing very well. It was, that wasn't why I retired because I thought the plant was going to be shut down. What reaction did you have when you heard that it was closed? Well, I hate to see the plant closed after being here all those years and knowing the amount of fiber that had gone out and what good it had done. I heard someone say that after the war, um, production had to be increased and the 400 RPM motors were being run at triple the speed of what they were designed to be uh, operating at. Do you remember uh, mm. some of the <coughs> fluctuations in production or anything? Well, like we had fluctuations, no question about that, in all the different fibers we made, the uh, yarn, the staple yarn, and the filament yarn. But uh, I don't recall what you're saying. You also had a part in making polyester. Yeah, we made polyester yarn there. 
several years before I left. Hey. I had an interesting experience in that I went over to England for how long, a month or so, I guess it was, working with them over there. And Harbin's Limited was the rayon manufacturer over there. And I worked with them on making tile yarn over there. And that was a very interesting experience, too. When the plant began to make the polyester, um, what type of chemicals? How was that made? Well, that was entirely different. I wasn't too involved with polyester, to tell you the truth. But uh, the uh, our Lewistown plant had been making some nylon, I think it was, so we started polyester down here. I wasn't too close to it, really. Well, what'd you do that whole fall that you went up there at Marcus Hook and stayed? You were working in polyester and... Well, I don't know what to tell you the truth. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah, you were doing something. <sighs> you stayed until Christmas. You must have been doing well, she something. she says I was away most of the time anyway. They well, quite she, he a was. Few years. He was. He was going to all the different tire manufacturers, particularly Acton, Ac Akron, Akron, Ohio, and uh, then he would be having to be going back and forth to the other plants within the system, too. But this this one particular time, you went up there and worked with, I think it was Dave Marion, you went up there at Marcus Hook and along about the end of the summer, and you were setting up polyester um, you were testing, I mean, you were starting it, getting it started. Well, it doesn't strike up no right now. You don't remember doing that? Mm -hmm. well, that's I, do. I, don't I do, I <laughs> do. <laughs> Could you work on them and I'll come back and we'll get that part. <laughs> After she jogs your memory, I'll come back. <laughs> oh, do you, um, could you share with us anything that that, uh, that you feel like sharing about what life was like during the 50s, the 60s, the 40s. Could you talk about how life uh, maybe was the same or different uh, from today? Or what it was like? Anything? Mm. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's better for You mean like the, the life within the plant? No, just life outside of the plant. Um, as a documentation of the life and times of that era. Well, we had young children then, of course, and they kept us pretty well tied down. But we had an active group out in the plant. We had, Catherine's got some of the magazines we had there you might want to look through. We had different parties and special events and things like that. And at that time, we only had the Front Royal Country Club had a swimming pool and tennis courts. But at that time, they were the only ones in town except for the ones up at the academy. So it was a very active place out there. And we had golf leagues and all that type of thing they had to plan. Oh, yeah. Well, I haven't heard anyone mention the golf league before. Mm -hmm. Different departments each had a golf team, and we played matches all summer long probably. You bowled at first. And well, the first thing, too, right? mm -hmm. the first thing when we first came into this house, I remember that every Monday night was bowling for him. He'd be gone. And then when I was in the Lions Club, we had a softball team, that type of thing. Do you want That's to talk nice about bowl. what life and times were like? Um, it's hard to say. It's hard to remember. No. No. We had fun, I think, because we had a great group of people. All the, so many of them are gone now, particularly the men. The women are still. We all still have our own group. We are all close. We're and active in the church and, and uh, the uh, play bridge and that type of thing, you know. It, it was 
not many dull moments, I'll say that. Practically every weekend there was something going on. Always the weekend. Uh, Saturday night was a night to howl. We'd uh, play bridge. We'd have so many of us that play bridge. There'd be four, usually four tables that, that got together and played on Saturday nights. And of course that branched out and varied too. We always attended the dances when um, it would start in the beginning of the year would be in January would be the March of Dimes dance. February would be the heart dance. And um, then uh, the time you were in charge of the doll, what was the Thanksgiving dance? Lawns? Who was it gave the doll, hundred dollar doll? And, we, and we'd all go. Everybody would go. We wore long dresses then, evening dresses. Men didn't put on tucks, but the ladies dressed up because it was there. <laughs> they were all tied down with children, you know, and babies. You know, most of them eventually, once the children got old enough, all went out to teach one thing or another. But to, to begin with, but the wives had an organization. We have to not that. as such. You know, I mean, it wasn't organized as such. We just were all close knit. It was a great. Group. It sounds like there was more of a community, a sense of community in the 50s than there is now. I think it's getting back to it. It seems to me to be, unless they're this group here and this group here and like that, but the town was so small then and anything that went on in the town everybody went and everybody chipped in and helped. But now it's it's gotten so large and people are living in so many little uh, uh, what do you call those areas like you live in they just um, so too. many of the workers now commute to Washington and all around them. that's it too. Not, yeah, I have to and the mothers are working my daughter teaches school has two children and is also an organist in the church my mm -hmm. other daughter's working teaching you could live on one salary back then. That's true. Yeah, and thought you were well off. And we all sort of participated in, in uh, whatever was going in, on in the town. The hospital for 18 years had a Follies. And it was loads of fun. Everybody would get in the Follies. And of course there was a Lions Club, which he started out in the Lions Club very shortly after we got here, he was about 47. And then, because of his travels, they allowed him to stay in for so long, and which I don't remember now how long it was, but then it, he couldn't attend meetings, and they allowed him to k keep his membership up until a point, and then they said, well, sorry. So then a little while after that, then he took, uh, was taken into Rotary, and the Rotary is having their 75th anniversary this coming Friday. Oh. So he came up in the Rotary and served his term as president and all that during that time. And then there's a moose in town and a elks and there's a lot of organizations here. A lot of them are still going strong. Some of them, are, I don't know. Could either one of you talk about <clears throat> how Avtex changed this area? I guess you weren't here. We weren't here enough ahead of time yeah, to really know, but no. there's all the difference in the world, I'm sure, because it's just a sleepy little town, though. Oh, you should you get someone who's, well, Edgar could tell you that, because he grew up here. Mm -hmm. Get some of the ones he that did. grew up in the area. Mm -hmm. How do you feel that the community was affected? Uh, following the closure of Avtex. Can you answer that? I can't answer it really. It was a letdown to everybody that had worked out there, of course. I think but some we of had the... a few radicals that complained about the aroma, the smell, and that type of thing, and uh, they were glad to see it go, I guess. But oh, yeah, all in was... all, it wasn't too much of that, as far as I could see. There was a lot of fussing and bitching about the the uh, Avtex fumes. We didn't, we didn't get it this bad unless the uh, wind changed up here on this hill. And I'll admit that somewhere down in the town and on the other side, it, going towards Strasburg, I think it would be rather smelly at times. 
And I do think um, it had an effect. You couldn't. We got to the point we didn't leave silver out because uh, it tarnished quickly. <laughs> and uh, I, I think some of the business people too could tell you better too about how the town itself was affected. Of course, a lot of people left and moved away, but a lot like us who were already at retirement level just stayed on. And now it's amazing how many people are coming in. That's what I can't understand. Bedroom community, of course, has been for quite a while. Yeah, there's traffic jams here now. Mm -hmm. There's been more people in the last eight years. It's awful. Royal Avenue is terrible. Of course, at the time we came, the bypass was a little two-lane road along the foot of the mountain as you came down 522 and came on across 55 and on down the foot, on down. It was just a little road. And it was wonderful and amazing the bypass was built. Oh, that was one of the big things. <laughs> no, I don't want to stop recording, but um, do you... Can you think of any other topics or subjects, comments? Well, I was on the hospital board for quite a while, and that has gotten to be quite a place out there now compared to what it was originally. It's expanded a whole lot and does a wonderful job as far as I'm concerned. And uh, practically all the churches in town have had expansion programs or remodeling programs. Oh, and all, there's been a lot of radical changes here, really. Really? Do you want to add anything about, um... Give me a, that book. I can't remember unless, um... You know, just off uh, the top of your head, you can't think of everything. Yeah, you want to turn this off for a while? Yeah. So could you tell me your name and a, a little bit about your husband's... Mm -hmm. Travels. Well, I'm Catherine, his wife, and he says he did not travel much, but I say he was gone all of the time. Sometimes, he would, in the days of when you only had one car, I would not have a car all week. And I remember my doctor bringing me a loaf of bread one night. <laughs> it was just one of those things that he was gone all the time, it seemed. And when he'd get home, he'd be here for the weekend, and maybe Monday, and then he'd have to go again. And real often, it was a spur of the moment type thing, too. He'd travel to the, the various uh, viscose plants, and other times he would travel to their customers, their tire yarn customers. And then there were the special trips, like going to help with setting up the plant in England. And one of the, the times he can't seem to remember as well as I do, and I guess it was because it was so long, he went for several months to set up a, a polyester, a, what do you call a, a, a pilot plant? That's what it was in, uh, in Marcus Hook. And he was gone uh, from late summer, or the end of the summer, until Christmas almost Christmas, maybe Thanksgiving. You mentioned the one time that a couple of trips, you mentioned earlier uh, when the chauffeur would come and... Oh, that was all the time. Uh, at first, as I said, we, he'd have to drive himself, but as he got a little bit more higher up in the, <laughs> in the plan of things out there, uh, Tom Baltimore, the plant chauffeur, would come and pick him up and take him to either the train or the plane, whichever he was going on. And if Tom couldn't take him, Paul Brooks would take him. And real often he would know, um, you see the uh, American Viscose main offices were in the uh, Empire State Building in New York. And sometimes he would have meetings there. And if he knew that uh, there would be a day or two, uh, I'd go with him, provided I could find someone to usually my mother, to come and stay with the children. And we'd go up and uh, 
uh, spend several days in New York. We didn't have the chauffeur to take us, nevertheless. We, oh, he will you usually drive up, and uh, he'd get up in early in the morning and go on and do what he had to do, and I'd get up and and spend the day on the street and shop in uh, New York. In those days, I I didn't mind a bit. I just had a wonderful time going around the, the big stores and. Uh, what was it? I've forgotten the name of that hotel. The Radio City Music Hall. Oh, well, I would go and, and get tickets during the day for shows at night. So we'd always go to uh, a show. And lots of times we went to the various uh, radio in those early days and then later uh, television shows. Rock so the Center, wasn't it? Well, that was, you know, the main one. Could you tell a story about his first trip again? Oh, <laughs> what, what you said. His first trip, I, I never will, for some reason, stuck in my mind. I will never forget because, it, to me, it seemed so ridiculous that the plant would send him to risk his life, life having to fly to Chicago for lunch. And he and Charlie Guile had to go to Chicago. And Hattie Lou, Charlie's wife, and I and each had a little boy. We went to the airport with them, and they were going to Chicago. And I was hoping and praying he'd get real sick flying, because he used to be sick if he went on rides at the fairs. So I was hoping he'd get so sick he'd never want to go again. I was scared to death of flying. <laughs> so, but he didn't. He flew quite a bit after that, <laughs> quite a bit. And uh, uh, there were other times that we went to New York with others, Art Baker and, and his wife Still, and Francis Carroll and Claude. We'd go up there together and spend like a weekend or two or three days or whatever. And the men would go to things during the day and then we'd go to things at night and that would be a lot of fun. Do you mind talking a little bit about the social life, the dances and the different things that you In studying? Front Royal? Well, we were just such a good, close-knit group of people and that we took part in, in anything that was going on in town. Most of the men were members of uh, the Lions or Kiwanis at the, uh, Kiwanis at the time. And um, also the community would have uh, dances. In January we had the, the March of Dimes dance. In February would be the Heart dance. In uh, uh, Thanksgiving was the line, I think the big lines dance. Uh, we were, I remember one Christmas, one Thanksgiving, we, uh, he was in charge of, they always had a doll um, with dollar bills uh, pinned on the doll and then they'd give that doll away. Well one of the men that came here and real often to the plant, and stayed here a lot of the time, won that doll and we always came back Usually at Thanksgiving dance, we came back here to this house, all the group together for breakfast after the dance, and we called up this fellow in the middle of the night, long, long two o'clock, to tell him he had won the hundred dollar doll. <laughs> and that I've got pictures. We have slide pictures of that of all the group that had come here and called him up. And he thought we were kidding or going crazy, one or the other. But that was a lot of money in those days, a hundred dollars. But we all went to the dances and danced and dressed up to go and just had a great time. Just a wonderful time. And then uh, we played a lot of bridge. That was our, kind of our main source of pleasure. We Not not like today. Today the, the wives or the women have bridge clubs and play a lot during just about every week or every couple of weeks. But in those days we played on Saturday nights the couples, men and women, played. And that was our big, big uh, night out, because during the week, we were tired. The women were usually staying home with the children. So, they had a good time. And in the summertime, there were, there, there were things to do, and usually taking the, the children out to the club for the one club, from Royal Country Club, and the one only pool. For swimming lessons, so we'd sit around the pool and watch them swim, and the others, the older ones, watch them swim. Uh, it was just another thing we all did together, and then picnicked out there, always on special times like uh, Fourth of July. Later, 
a lot of us in the women learned to play golf and were able to get out by then. And so we had had really good times going out there and playing uh, um, scotch and six foursomes or just playing together and picnicking and hanging around out there. The Front Royal Country Club was the, I guess, the main social center for, for us in those days. Want to add anything else? Uh, do you want to add any? Did, did you remember anything that uh, you'd like to say for the future? Of course, we were all involved in school, PTA, and in our own respective churches. I can say that, I think, in all of us. With the Avtex retirees and their wives or the people who used to work at Avtex, many of them that I've spoken with, they seem to be more involved in community activities today. They, I, well, could be that quite a few are. I think they always were, as I mentioned before. We were all um, taking part in the Hollywood, I mean the uh, Follies, that, the Red Stock and Follies that the hospital for, uh, and Lions Club combined used to uh, uh, hold every year as a, their big money making thing. That was a big thing too. Um, I can remember being a part of uh, some of the plant functions. I remember having to play the piano for for different uh, little uh, talent shows that the children had. We had always had a Christmas party when the children were little out at the plant, uh, uh, what do you call it, the, where they eat, cafeteria, yeah. And they'd have a Christmas party. And there were things going on from, that we could do, and as the children got old enough, then we got out on our own. Do you think Avtex, your husband's work at Avtex, was responsible for sending all of your kids to college, um, your quality of life? It must have been because I did, I did not work until my youngest child was in the fifth grade. I did not earn a penny. After that, I went back to school, and uh, I went back to teaching, and many of the others did too. Ms. Mallinson, Mrs. Morgan, many of them went back to uh, teaching, and Ms. Perry, who before were really just home. I guess in those days, too, we talk about that now. We, we say we couldn't begin to go to, go to work and raise the children and, at the same time. And I know I couldn't because he wasn't ever home. I would have been alone, and yet the young women are doing it today alone. So it's just a, a change in the times and the way of living. And of course you have a lot lot of easy things to make, supposedly, to make life a little easier, supposedly. <laughs> Did you turn it off for a minute? I'm trying to think. Well, wait a minute. Let me think. Okay. Get over there. Um, was um, he was chairman of the, the March of Dimes drive. The first, the first chairman was was Clarence Gregory. I don't guess he was the first one, but he was the one that got him to, who recommended that he be appointed the chairman. Well, that was a whole month of money raising events in January. A month of bridge clubs and bridge parties. I don't mean clubs, but parties. Uh, school functions and any uh, talent shows, anything that would help bring in a nickel they had during the month of January. And uh, the second year that after he was in, I was the chairman of uh, the bridge party. And before it had been held at the hotel, and you couldn't get but so many tables in there, so I wanted to have it with the uh, at the Union Hall. Oh well it had never been done. And uh, I think I had some co-chairman, I can't remember, I'm sure I'd had helpers, but I can't remember. It was some of the same group, uh, all of us, Visco's wives, 
So we decided we were going to do it anyway and had it at the bridge, at the, uh, had the bridge party at the Union Hall, which turned out to be the biggest one we had ever had. And that was always a big thing, of course it was a money-making event, you know, and the men came and the women came and big prizes were given out and it brought in money. And some of that is in one of those Viscose magazines, all about the March of Times. Well, see, things like that took up energy and time. And well, years ago, then the cadets marched down to church every Sunday. Yeah. And now they don't barely see any of them there. But that's no. They have their own service up there now, I think. And your husband was uh, the head of the Sunday school? He was superintendent for, for five years. Which church is This was Front Royal United Methodist. And also started Scout 42, Scout Troop. That was when we, when we first got here. And at the Front Royal United Methodist Church, Scout Troop 52 is still in operation. Oh yeah, very much so. Oh, very much. Yeah. And you started it. Mm -hmm. I was the first coat master anyway. <laughs> Somebody talked me into it. <laughs> An another money-making event that I had a part in, they used to have uh, fashion shows quite a bit. And that that was always uh, a money raiser. Cause people loved to go to that. Even the men even went. But of course all the ladies liked it. And I used to play the piano for it. Because uh, I would uh, play songs that the reason they asked me to do it and they wanted me to do it is I would play songs that uh, pertain to whatever they were showing, you know, popular music most mainly, you know, mm -hmm. Alice Blue Gown if it was a beautiful blue dress and, you know, whatever. So I had a good time doing that. I would, I'd play uh, uh, for the fashion shows and they were held at uh, Union Hall usually, some at the Skyline Ferry which was the here then. That was one of the main places to... Skyline uh, Terrace, that's Dean's restaurant now. Now. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. All right. Oh, that was a big place. And of course the hotel, but they tore down the hotel, which was really sad that they did. That was a very historic and a very beautiful place. I forget what's there now. I've seen a picture of the hotel. Uh, it's just a 7-Eleven, isn't it? On that car? So, yeah. Or bank? Something on the corner of uh, Sixth and Royal Avenue, um, but that was a lovely old hotel. Many weddings were there. In fact, it was about the main place to have. We I don't mean the wedding itself, but the receptions. You know, that was about the only place to have a reception. What was the name of that hotel? The Royal Hotel, hotel Royal. Royal. Hotel Royal. Mr. Biggs, do you? Um from from where I am. Now this is the, could you talk a little bit about what this award was? The JC's Man of the Year Award? Mm -hmm. Outstanding Young Man of the Year. And your husband was the second one to get that award. As, as far as I remember, that was it. Was it for his community service? Supposedly, it, it, it this was I guess the following year or shortly after he had done all the work for the March of Dimes. Okay. And um, for his March of Dimes work then. And that that March of Dimes is in one of these magazines. I write up about that. Do you remember where the award was given? Well, it was at the John Marshall, which was a kind of a. Um, Roadhouse or something out here on 55, which is no longer here. I believe it burned down. And uh, the fellow in the background, Granish, he didn't work at the plant, did he? Mm -hmm. And who's the one giving it to you? That's who I can't remember. Mm -hmm. And the one behind him is a plant person. I can't remember his name. Mm -hmm. Today is Wednesday, April the 10th, 2001, and we're here with, could you say your name? Charlie Riffey. Charlie Riffey. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, could you talk a little bit about when you began working at Avtex and which departments you were in? Okay. Well, uh, of the ones you're interviewing, uh, uh, I've been a wanderer through the company. I was hired in at Nitro, West Virginia in uh, June of 1950. Uh, I came aboard as a uh, control chemist in the technical department. It was my first job, really my only job since school. And um, I was in that department for four years. And then I went to a production department, the staple department, as a, a technical assistant. Then a few years later, I was assistant department head. I'm going to turn it off for just a minute. Okay. Whenever you're ready, sir. Okay. I, I cheated a little bit. I made some notes because I can't remember dates that well. Um, I think I had uh, said I had just gone to the staple department. That was in 1954 as a technical assistant. And then uh, uh, in 1959, I was the assistant department head in the staple manufacturer. Then in uh, 1962, uh, I went up front, as we call it, to the, uh, the assistant to the manufacturing superintendent. Uh, this was all at Nitro, West Virginia. And in that period, also, the company became a division of FMC Corporation. We, prior to that, we were American Viscose Corporation, which I can elaborate on some other time. Um, I was in that job working uh, between production departments until uh, 1965, and then I uh, was made the technical superintendent of the Nitro plant. So you began your career in Nitro, West Virginia? Yes. I was there 20 years before I left. That bad plan, uh, and then you came here with 20 years of experience. Well, a little more than that. Um, I, I, when the nitro plant, uh, I left nitro plant as the manufacturing superintendent and went to Parkersburg, West Virginia, uh, as the plant manager. And I was there four years. Then I went to a corporation department. It's called Rayon Process Improvement Department. And I was in uh, from seven, let's see, 74 to about 78. Then, and, and we were on the road, plant to plant. There was a few of us there. Jim Corr was one. Um, troubleshooting and just uh, helping to work on plant problems and solutions. Then uh, I went back to Nitro as tech superintendent again in the 19, late 77. Then the nitro plant was closed down in 1980, and I was transferred to the Meadville, Pennsylvania plant, which made a, a different product, although it's similar, it's cellulose acetate, and that was an old plant. Um, and I was there from 1980 to 1985, and then we uh, closed the uh, Meadville plant in 1985, and I came to Front Royal. So. I have, while I have been in and out of this plant uh, for years on project work or just uh, meeting with people here, um, I came here to stay in 1985. And, uh, but the same companies owned all of these plants? Well, th there were, let me see, I don't have it in front of me, but there were seven major plants and I believe Counting two late plants in, in the were built in the fifties or early sixties that made nine, but the major plants of the corporation. This, by the way, was the last plant built, last round plant built. Um, there was Marcus Hook. There was uh, Pennsylvania. There was um, oh, Roanoke, Virginia. Sorry, uh, 1917 or 15, I believe. Parkersburg, West Virginia, uh, Nitro, West Virginia, um, well, Lewistown was before Nitro, then Nitro, West Virginia, then Meadville, Pennsylvania, six. and then Front Oil was the seventh plant, which was built in 39 and 40, I think began production in 40.
campus, so the plant was 45 years old when I came here to stay, but as I say, I've been in and out quite a few times. Could you talk, am I interrupting? No, no. Hmm. Could you talk a little bit about what you did when you came around to the different plants? What, what were your work duties? What did you, what okay. were you looking for when you came here? Um, okay, well, um, when I was um, on the uh, traveling squad, so to speak, we were looking for uh, uh, either production rate, uh, capacity problems, how to get uh, increased capacity, minimal cost, um, how to uh, preserve quality. Uh, if there's frequently there might be a quality problem and we would work on those things. Um, I came down here as an assist and assistant plant manager before and then I became a technical manager. Uh, so all the time we were looking, well process control was, was, uh, was more of my end of the business, although I was in direct manufacturing for quite a few years. But um, the, uh, the rayon process is a rather complex chemical process and it has several days of material in process that you you can't just turn the plant, start it up and turn it off like with a switch. It takes a few days for materials to all run through it. And so there are many variables in there that have to be controlled very carefully to get the product you want and, and uh, fully acceptable. And uh, so the, the technical department and working with manufacturing responsibilities are to keep things just right. And of course that becomes a responsibility of the individual people in the plant. And um, uh, our people who worked in the same departments for many years became really experts. And, and we who were there on the theory of things and process certainly did not have the skills that the individual production people had in doing things with their hands and minds. But um, anyway, that was that was been my real focus through most of my career. What were some of the problems that you were called out here on? What are some of the quality problems that uh, occurred during your tenure, and how did you fix them? What did you do? Well, <laughs> it, it's it's uh, some some problems uh, are not easily solved, and even people more expert than I, uh, the, the uh, cellulose chemistry is is a pretty complex world and there's uh, a lot of things that did happen in our plants uh, had a lot of variables in them themselves and, and you weren't, even if you had spent a lot of time with it, you weren't really sure which variable was controlling. So, so um, uh, typical problems would be in spinning of a, a filament yarn, we would have platinum iridium uh, jets uh, started out, well, the smallest ones are about the diameter of a dime. These were used in the textile yarn continuous filament products. Um, they would have maybe 40 to 100 holes or something like that. But in the staple fiber, we had some uh, jets that were 3 inches in diameter, and they had 36,000 holes in one jet. So when you have 36,000 filaments coming out uh, very rapidly, uh, they tend to weave together and initially they're still in a plastic form, they're very sticky and they tend to stick together. So anyway, some of the problems ha involve getting the, the regenerating chemicals to these filaments without causing them to stick together. So, because if they do stick together, they make a defect in the product. And uh, we, these are called cemented filaments. Uh, if a filament breaks off, and, 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 it's, and then it has to start again, you get a little blurb, and that's either called a flake or a worm in some places, and that's a defect. And so when you, uh, our customers who use uh, staple fiber particularly to weave cloth and so on, if these defects uh, are I I present, they will show up in their product. So that is a continual, around the clock uh, situation that the production people and the technical people and so on watch and, and um, uh, we, we test the, the, the products 
uh, for uh, the same things that the customer's looking for, too. If we find those, we either degrade it or we take it out of the mainstream quality line. So, well, that's that's a dying is a it can be a problem <coughs> if you have process variables that can affect the uh, dye uptake rates of uh, the product, things like that. If if the uh, your generating solutions uh, go out of should go out of control, you can have a strength problem, um, that sort of thing. So, it's uh, continuous monitoring of things that might sound simple, but uh, they more complicated than the sand. You said that there were different variables at work. I've heard someone mention the quality of the cellulose itself. Okay. Um, what are some of the other variables? That's the only one I've heard of so far. Well, uh, the source of cellulose for rayon is, is wood. I, I have a few years ago I prepared a talk on clothing from trees that maybe sometime we can discuss that. But anyway, uh, it's from uh, trees. M most common is softwoods, the conifers, pine, spruce, and so on. Um, and the highest quality pulps that we bought, usually the woods came out of Canada. Um, and we were uh, joint owners of uh, Ketchikan Pulp Company in uh, Ketchikan, Alaska. And they provided the bulk of our pulp for at least for our Brown staple fiber, and we bought pulp from other well-known producers, uh, Rainier being one of them. The uh, the quality of the pulp is uh, is can also be variable. Uh, the, the principal quality of, of a high quality dissolve we call a dissolving pulp one that's headed for an industry like ours because the key to the viscous process is how do you dissolve pulp make a fluid solution out of it, then cast it or spin it into a filament, uh, and then convert it back to its original form in cellulose. Uh, but anyway, the, the, the term is DP, degree of polymerization, which is the length of the, uh, the minimal length of the cellulose molecule. It really means the number of glucose units. So uh, it, it, some of our products uh, which were high strength, such as our tar yarns were the highest strength product we ever made, and we, in re more recent years, we've made high strength staple fiber products, which allowed them to go into more critical end use. Uh, it also took uh, high grade, the highest grade of pulp, which obviously was a lot more expensive because the pulp manufacturers had to go through more processing steps to make sure we got the, the best of, of theirs. So. Uh, uh, that is, generally speaking, the uh, uh, principal quality of pulp that was of interest to us. There are other things that affected how the pulp performed in our process. The density it was packed, if it was were compressed too tight and, and, and the steeping or soaking it didn't open up and, and get the caustic soda into all the molecules and so on, that could create a problem to us in, in, in our viscous solution. So that was important too, and and we had testing from the beginning through the end of our operation to uh, measure quality and, and performance of the raw materials and the stuff and whatever we made from those raw materials. How did you solve the problem of the thirty-six, uh, the three-inch diameter Jet. jets? The cords of gelling, cementing. How well, <laughs> was a, that was a, almost a continuous work, but uh, w w one of the uh, principal things was how to get the, um, we would call it the spin bath solution, which would be an acid, zinc, and certain sulfate solution, in, uh, water solution, into the jets. <coughs> we, uh, the jets would have patterns in them like little avenues. So if you can imagine 36,000 holes in a jet about that big around, and with also channels running through there so that the acid could had a flow path to, uh, and could get into the depth of the jet. Then the other thing would be the, the uh, smooth flow versus turbulent flow of the bath past this jet. And so our machines have baffles and things in them to help uh, 
make that a very smooth flow and to minimize the turbulence or the uh, pulling these filaments together. You could take a bottom of a beaker and look down over a jet and watch it spin and you could see these jets, or you could see these things weaving together and uh, you could tell there was a problem in one of them. Or if one of them was spitting out defects, then you would immediately change that jet, put a fresh one in its place, and that would go back to the jet room uh, to be cleaned and whole because if it were a broken or interrupted filament, it was usually because there was a little particle, microscopic particle in one of those holes that caused the flow to stop periodically then it, and so on. So there was a lot of work uh, directed towards recycling these jets <coughs> to keep them producing perfectly good. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> yeah. Uh, okay, Sandy, I, I might also comment that uh, 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 the, the quality of the visco solution, and that was what, we, what would be uh, called in the terms of like all plastic fibers like nylon and polyester and polypropylene, they, it would be called a dope, which, which has the, the uh, molecules in a, in a heat uh, heated solution dissolve that way. But ours was viscose and the key to the process uh, is how you take pulp from a tree and dissolve it. It was the use of carbon bisulfide and that was our, a key raw material. And, and uh, in our so-called churns uh, <coughs> we uh, uh, mixed a carbon bisulfide solution with with uh, sodium alkali cellulose which was the uh, steeped or the wet crumb that came from the, the started out with the pulp and then this uh, mixture crummy mixture was dropped into our dissolvers or mixers and more sodium hydroxide and water was added and made this syrup like a syrup and it looked a lot like honey or molasses and it was very even thicker than that. And uh, but uh, there, if we had a little defect in the pulp that we started with, we might have fibers in there that wouldn't sanitate. In the term, in other words, they wouldn't uh, start dissolving, and they would they had to be filtered out because they would block interrupt the spinning process. And if they partially dissolved and then completely dissolved they would make what we call a gel, which is like a little ball of gelatin. So, And that would blind uh, the filters, and if some of it was, it, it could actually warm its way through, you know, a very tight cloth, could partially interrupt the flow in the, in the jet and cause these uh, particular flakes or uh, worms. So the viscose quality was very critical, it, not only its chemical content, but its stability or its ripeness. Ripeness was a term we used to say because it was not a, a, a just a dead solution, it was a dynamic solution and its chemical balance was changing all the time by the hour until it became <coughs> solid. So at a certain ripeness that that what this goes was ready to be spun and you could make a, a, a filament from it, you could apply tension and so on and make a, a stronger filament so the quality of the viscose was extremely important, and filtration was the was our weapon for removing the impurities, uh, which was, were primarily non-dissolved cellulose, and get them out of the system before uh, it was pumped up to the spinnerets, the jets. Um, the uh, by the time the viscose went through the spinning operation. Uh, there were specifications there, and we could change the chemical solutions, the baths, uh, the amount of stretch uh, that we elongated the fiber that's coming out of the jet uh, before it crystallized into a solid product, um, and we could vary the properties uh, of, of the fiber. In fact, in staple fiber, one of the real uh, attributes of well, staple fiber was that we they were the product was engineered depending upon what the customer needed uh, uh, to, for, to make their product, whether it was a cloth, uh, whether it was a, 
a bulky garment uh, where it was a carpet, but it was going into non-woven products like for diapers or towels and stuff like that. Uh, depend, uh, he wanted a certain kind of fiber, and so we would, would produce a fiber uh, to satisfy his needs. And through the years, certainly in the years I was around, uh, we worked with the development of a number of uh, products were, which were taken for granted in this country now. Uh, one of them being non-wovens, which we began working with Johnson Johnson Chickpea Division years ago in the 50s to make non-woven products, which was different from the old spun yarn and weaving. Non-wovens are just, the, the fibers are carted out on a carding machine and then they're laminated, they're laid down in layers. There's no spinning, uh, textile spinning involved. And, and uh, we worked with them for years uh, in getting just what it took to make a good product. And uh, w my wife still buys these uh, handy wipe towels everywhere we can find them uh, because they're so handy. And they're, they last so long and, and uh, they do a good job. Uh, diapers, w we were, our company was pioneer in formation of non-woven diapers, disposable diaper. Of course, through the years that has changed and, and and our company in the final years produced a polypropylene fiber, which is an all plastic, all synthetic fiber, which uh, was going primarily into um, sporting clothing, diapers and things because polypropylene had a wicking problem. It did not absorb, does not absorb water, but it has a uh, great property of capillary action of wicking away moisture from the surface. So you don't, if you perspire, you don't feel it, or if you're a baby, you wets his diaper, it isn't, it isn't uh, uncomfortable for the baby and so on. So this added a lot to it. But still the, the, the absorption, absorption fibers behind that would be uh, most likely rayon because rayon is more absorbent than cotton. Uh, w we were into the carpet business uh, for quite a few years and, and uh, with research and, and working with our plants and I was involved in a good bit of that. We were producing different types of fibers for the carpet industry. Uh, the, one of the first requirement was a, a, a coarse fiber. Uh, uh, another uh, requirement was a fiber had to be resilient. If you mash it down, it has to come back up. Uh, so we went through several generations of, of coarse deniers, uh, various degrees of crimp, what we call crimp, which made a fiber sort of like a spring in a way. It wasn't that strong, but it was it acted like a spring. It had a, a circular or torsional twist in it, which made it just uh, curlicue, and, and it was a res more resilient fiber. And our crimp fibers went into certain bulky garments and clothing, like in jackets or sweaters and things like that, whereas the non-crimps went into smooth fabrics, you know, like broadcloth and uh, Oh, I can't think of, the, the, there's so many different fabric to that. But anyway, uh, so we went through that, and then at one time we were producing a, a soil-resistant carpet fiber. The first one was called Fiber O. It was a, a completely round uh, cross-section, like a, a zero, uh, th Then, but it had no resiliency, so it didn't last long. Then we made a, a fiber at one time, it was current fiber, that was coated with silicon oxide, which filled the cracks, so to speak, and there wasn't any place for the dirt to cling. And uh, that uh, we sold that for a while, uh, and they were, they were as non-soilable uh, fibers, it was called. Uh, but the, those developments uh, led to other things. Uh, we made uh, um, uh, fiber resi uh, fire-resistant products, and this is where the uh, the fire-resistant compound was injected into the viscose stream. So then when the fiber was regenerated, it, it had uh, this fire-resistant compound right in the filament. It, was, it wasn't a coating, it was right inside. Which also led to other things, we made colors. So our various plants made uh, they were spun dyed colors and uh, just a f fully rain full rainbow of that. And, uh, 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 that that was a big market. Did you have anything to do with uh, 
coming up with some of these ideas? Where did you all invent some of these? I know well, you know. Well, <laughs> I, I was not the brain that invented these things. No, I was certainly one of the facilitators who made the idea, say an idea work, because uh, one time we had a uh, we had a staple development plant at Nitro, and they were a link between pure research. And we had one time we had a major and large research department in Marcus, Pennsylvania. And in 1976, it was moved to Front Royal. Uh, but um, those people did more with the original concepts. But there's a long way to go from a test tube and getting to spin one on a, on a tabletop to making it spin uh, hundreds of pounds per hour in a, in a big production plant. And so I was involved in getting some of these things into uh, an operation that would run and, and so on, that, that type of thing. But uh, I'm not sure where many of these ideas originated. But How did you come up with the solution that would dissolve the cellulose? Uh, it just seems almost a fantastic idea to take the wood pulp, yeah. dissolve it, turn it back into the cellulose. Well, that that is, you just spoke the uh, chemistry, the the miracle of, of the rayon vis uh, viscose process. Um, the original work, and I don't have notes in front of it, but it goes back into Europe into the uh, uh, late 1800s. Uh, uh, I can't remember the names. Another time, I'd be glad to okay. make a presentation on it, but. Uh, a French chemist was involved in first dissolving cellulose. The first dissolved cellulose was a nitrate. Do you remember the old plastic cellulose, cellulose, uh, celluloid? I'm sorry, celluloid. Uh, when I was a kid, they used to make little cupid dolls and things out of plastic yes. celluloid. Well, that was also that was cellulose nitrate. That was also gun cotton was cellulose nitrate, which uh, uh, the, the military used through World War One. Uh, as gunpowder, it was uh, in, in strings, it was gun cotton and cellulose nitrates, which had an almost instantaneous flam flammability property. It would burn just like that. That's what made the dolls disappear. Uh, that was, it was dangerous. Cellulose nitrate was dangerous. Then came along cellulose acetate, which is our safety film that we use in our cameras and things, and that tape probably. Uh, and our Mego plant produced cellulose acetate, and I did spend five years there. but. Uh, uh, the the uh, pro uh, the chemistry went from cellulose nitrate into uh, pure cellulose, which is the original stuff. Uh, in late 1888 or 89, I think it was, uh, and then finally uh, 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 some British scientists got a hold of this thing. Uh, I think it's like 1895, who who came up with the viscose process, which was the key of converting cellulose through an alkaline uh, cellulose, substituting um, sodium for a carbon, and then uh, carbon bisulfide, which substituted a sulfur atom for oxygen, and then you found out that this was a, a xanthated cellulose, which was soluble. It would dissolve in, in caustic soda and water. So that's the key thing to it. Uh, then once it's dissolved, it's again a very dynamic solution and changing so then you have to take it, and we, we call it aging. We had these huge cellars in which the viscose would, would travel, uh, and some of it would be a few, uh, two or three days getting to the other end. Depends on the product we were making. And some of it would get down there in maybe a day, 20, 24 hours. We call that the age. And at all the time, we were testing this solution uh, in our laboratories to see when it was ripe, because if the temperature it would change in the cellar, or it, there was some problem introduced. Uh, it would ripen at a different rate, so we had to follow that all the time. And then when it was uh, just right, it was called a salt index, which was a measure of how easily the cellulose could be re-coagulated in this test. And then when it was just about where this narrow range, it had to spin within that range. Um, but anyway, that's that was that's the key to dissolving wood, ending up with a pure cellulose again. Although what's happening, the the chemical molecule, the cellulose molecule, is being shortened with time. Uh, 
it, uh, we get the longest molecule we can buy in the water pulp, uh, but through the chemical reactions on down through, uh, the, the molecule is being shortened. And then uh, what may start out as a uh, few thousand uh, uh, units, um, uh, glucose units in, in the pulp, would be end up with a few hundred, but still, the, the, the longer the molecule we could preserve, uh, the stronger the filament and, and, the, and the higher strength the pro our product would be made. Yeah, when you were talking about the stickiness, I found myself wondering if you were tweaking the acidic solution at all, or tweaking well, the alkaline. Whoop. The, or uh, if there was a magical right. additive or anything, I just yeah, yeah, there's some of that. Uh, most uh, most of the well, when we would make take a basic uh, uh, cellulose solution viscose, uh, it, it could be tweaked a little bit. That we had modifiers that we could inject in that that would affect the coagulation rate when when it was regenerated in the spinning bath. Now, by affecting that regeneration rate, we could tweak the specifications at spinning. We had other additives we could add to the spinning solution, or and we had what we call stretch, which is very important. The uh, yarn would be regenerated, gathered on one wheel, goatee wheels, and between here would be another goatee wheel, and this goatee wheel could be rerunning faster than this one. So it was elongating this filament as it was being regenerated. And then we had it still a different treatment. We call our cascading, um, and then finally to the big toe drum, which was a prime mover, <laughs> which kept things moving. Uh, it was a big drum that wrapped around it, and then it went into our cutters, and the cutters' uh, speed and so on was uh, set and geared so it didn't change uh, to cut various length. And we had uh, so one pro. Properties of a staple fiber include the coarseness of the film, you know, a very fine film, a very coarse film, which was called denier, um, the staple length, and then a, a, mod, a, a code for the, uh, for the type of viscose it was made from, the, uh, the luster, a bright luster would be very lustrous, and it would, uh, a lot of people remember the old rayon, a very lustrous, shiny fabric. But it also, we had pigments we could induce and it would make it very dull and we could make it colors or we could make it flame proof or flame resistant anyway, and things like that. So uh, there, there were a lot, of, a lot of variables that were engineered into rayon, uh, perhaps to a finer degree than, than even the plastic fibers that came along later. Well, did you receive some special training um, could I, could I just talk about your education for a minute? I know mm -hmm. they had a lot of training programs at Avtex. Mm -hmm. um, one man, Calvin Fox, for instance, mm -hmm. uh, helped the engineers come up with some different um, solutions uh, in the equipment that he could see. Mm -hmm. uh, could you talk a little bit about did your education prepare you for work at Avtex, or did you receive the training while you were there? How well, I'd say uh, a bit of both. Um, I, um, I came aboard as a chemical engineer from West Virginia University in 1950, uh, and we had been disciplined in a lot of basic fields and so on, but um, so while you have a lot of tools to work with, uh, coming to work for a rayon company was a totally new experience and it was really, you, your background really I think just prepared you uh, to be able to learn because uh, certainly the uh, chemistry of the process, all the variables of the process and things were, was information that you acquired there on the job and, um, and hopefully through the years we were able to use some of our basic um, tools and, and, and formulating answers and to these problems. I was involved for a few years in uh, supervisory training of employees uh, at Nitro and uh, this this was a program that was really designed and, and uh, formulated by the University of Chicago. Then a few of us went to training 
classes ourselves in which we were taught or familiarized with the material and we came back to the plants and, and, and uh, had classes of maybe 20 to 30 people at a, at a class and and uh, we would you know represent the, the material that we had learned but they, some of them were on human aspects of management which, which, which ran for about a year it was mainly on just uh, dealing with it, getting along dealing with people how to get people to uh, do their work and enjoy it and respect their leaders and how to be a better leader and that sort of thing. Then we had uh, other things we had on basic economics, we had for a small group we had a technical report writing, this kind of training. And then, then there was the engineering training which Calvin certainly was involved in, in which the craftsmen of the plant were, were uh, 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 would-be craftsmen were taught basic skills of basic mathematics, uh, the, the uh, knowledge of, the, of a particular trade, whether it was a mechanic or a welder or a carpenter or whatever, the skills uh, of that trade um, by people who were skilled, certainly not by me, but people who were skilled in that uh, area. And, and uh, I believe that our plants, front oil being a big one, and uh, were probably trained more craftsmen than maybe any other company, maybe DuPont might be an exception, but uh, we had these training programs going on all the time and, and uh, what we did was uh, a lot of our craftsmen, uh, uh, once they were acquired skills, uh, might leave and go somewhere else if they could get a little higher pay and so on. So we did a lot of training for other companies, but we had we were known as a good training operation. This this applied to operators as as well as to uh, skilled craftsmen. The operators how to operate their equipment, you know, and, and, and that would be used just primarily in our plants. It just sounds like one of the differences I've noticed um, with the age of American viscose versus today. Uh, it seems like. More education is required before entering the field now, whereas uh, at Avtex, um, people were trained to do their jobs basically by the company. It well, that's a good point. Uh, I think I think that's true. Um, uh, we were trainers of people who came aboard with, uh, you know, little specialized knowledge, although we. Uh, after the war, you know, we, uh, basic qualification was a high school education. But during the war, that was not always possible. And, and still, we had some very smart people who, who never went to high school. But uh, as you know, as high school education became more common, then that was a basic requirement. Uh, and then for, for some of our fields, you know, technical people and so on, they needed a professional degree to be hired. But um, th there was a lot of training on the job and specific to our operation, uh, the, the uh, operating people's, uh, op uh, what they learned was primarily adjusted to uh, for our operations, whereas the craftsmen, the skilled craftsmen, those would be more universal, which would be, you know, the, the uh, carpenters, uh, pipe fitters, uh, mechanics, and so on. These these people's skills would be pretty well universal, you know, in other industries too. I'm sorry to pull you off into okay. another direction. Do you have um, other topics on your notes? Well, I thought of one time? area that that uh, I haven't heard discussed much recently, and, and I think it's important, and that is that uh, uh, conservation uh, of chemicals and and materials, uh, all of our plants were designed and operated to get uh, as much use out of anything we, any raw material or chemicals and so on that we bought before we got to the point that it was, was no longer economical to use and it became a waste. At that point, all waste streams went through uh, a waste treatment plants and each plant had one. Now, another thing is that the, the environmental laws, as older people certainly realize, are relatively new. Uh, 
When I went to work in 1950, there were a uh, few regulations upon discharges from the stream. Uh, uh, we, all of our plants used a lot of water. A lot of it was cooling water and never became contaminated. This water could be put back in the stream and no, with no effect. Uh, Waste water is the water that we use to wash with, uh, to wash our chemicals or, or to dilute, make solutions and so on. Once they were exhausted, uh, to be, they needed to be treated before they would return to the stream. But these laws became more, complica more complex and so on throughout the years. And, and I was involved in, in the type of operation and know that never did we operate in a manner which, which uh, knowingly that violated any law, environmental law, but they became more strict uh, with years passing, and and the plants spent more and more money, and it became a lot more expensive to operate as these facilities were added. This involved not only returning water to the streams, but it involved exhausting uh, our air and fumes uh, to the air, and, and of course one of them being the uh, particulate matter that was discharged from the boiler houses, which. All of our, well, most all of our boilers were coal fired. And so you uh, used to, we had the type of boilers we had, you made cinders. And that, that, those things came out the bottom, and people would love to buy cinders from us because, uh, and so that took care of a lot of the waste. But then when uh, the newer boilers all uh, discharged fly ash, well, that was like dust in the air. And so then through the years, the, the plants all had to. Uh, either install uh, electronic precipitators uh, or ba this plant went with bag houses which meant that all of the air that went out of the boiler house was filtered which caught this stuff and then then the, so when we had we have a, a fly ash landfill on site that was what came out of these filters bags and, and it made um, uh, good use in the soil so in fact when I was in college there there was research. No, I was involved in. There was research on going how to use flash and it, everything from making building blocks, what we used to be center blocks, to uh, fill in highway, macadam highways, uh, all sorts of stuff. But anyway, a lot of flash ends up in the ground, and and uh, uh, so that was a, 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 a thing there. But the, the the what I really wanted to talk about was the recycling of the chemicals. All of our plants, we uh, sulfuric acid was a raw material, zinc was a raw material, uh, and caustic soda. But uh, we recycled from these spinning baths. Uh, water was being regenerated in the regeneration all the time, but from the water in the viscose and from the reaction, neutralization of the acid that's performed from the water. <coughs> But so we had a major operation in the plant called the acid department, whose purpose was to evaporate the water, which just went into the air as pure as steam, and which concentrated these solutions, and then uh, down to the point that uh, they could be reused. Now, it took some fresh chemicals with them, but we recycled our acid, uh, we recycled our zinc, and uh, in the waste treatment process, some in later years, we found that we could uh, knock this zinc out and keep even the waste solution zinc from going to the stream by uh, precipitating it and forming a sludge. And th there are residual sludge basins there now with zinc hydroxide in them. The, the, but that zinc was going to be recovered. It was we call it mining, which is a big uh, pump of a thing uh, rode in that those basins and pumped it over to a zinc recovery plant, which. Uh, filtered and concentrated that sludge and then treated again with strong acid and made zinc sulfate again. So all the zinc that we took out through waste treatment was intended and was coming back to the plant to be reused again. Um, uh, the acid, uh, we we'll talk about the recycling of the acid, recycling of the zinc. And uh, uh, at, uh, for a number of years, we, the company worked for years, and I was involved in that, of taking carbon bisulfide out of the stack, out of the streams, and recycling it again and reusing it. At Nitro, from work done at the pilot plant, uh, it came to the uh, production department in 1954. In fact, that's 
I went to the stable department to accompany that project. Um, and, and where we took, we stripped the toes uh, and the spinning machine uh, with steam, hot water and steam, and then, then we condensed the carbon bisulfide out of that, and we trickled it down through tires and purified it a little bit, and we recycled it. Uh, that turned out not to be economical. Uh, we, we tried another generation of that, which we went a little different place in the process and did that over again. And uh, we, we operated that thing for a few years, but it, it, it got to be just uh, uneconomical to maintain and to operate. Front Oil uh, did see us to recovery for a longer period of time, a different uh, attack. They absorbed the uh, CS2 from the uh, fume stream uh, into carbon pack absorbers, and then, then they stripped that with steam and then condensed it and recycled the carbon bisulfide that way. Uh, and they ran that for several years uh, to the point that uh, it just was, they couldn't uh, afford to maintain it and operate it. Uh, our wash waters, where we removed all the chemicals from the product on the way to becoming a finished product, those waters were recycled, some of them as many three times they were reused in a countercurrent fashion until we could get no more good out of them. And then they went to a waste stream, which went to waste treatment. Uh, and that was two or three different baths operations. But uh, the plants, uh, that was probably never discussed, but the plants were designed to recycle and to reuse as much of uh, uh, chemicals and so on as possible, as we could at least uh, break even with it, uh, to keep them out of the uh, environment. And what we could no longer do with had to be treated in waste treatment. Want me to stop this for a minute? Yeah. Wait, wait, I find it. Okay. Yeah. Just sketchy notes. Whenever you uh, ready. Sandy, I, one final thing, and probably more interest than a lot of the things I've been talking about, is some of the products. Uh, that our plants made, and, and uh, I suspect that uh, even the, our local public uh, isn't aware of all of them. Um, the tire cord was one of our uh, principal products here at Front Royal and also at Lewistown, Pennsylvania plant. Uh, the more advanced and uh, process and, and products were made here at Front Royal uh, through what we call our double deck spinning. Uh, these were high strength rayon continuous filament cords which went into automobile tires, aircraft tires, industrial belts and hoses. Um, and in fact the softest, most comfortable riding cars ever were rayon, uh, at least even partially rayon, because uh, rayon was dimensionally stable, it didn't soften and flow under the heat of a tire. And so your, your your tires were. In fact, I've bought rayon tires that never the wheel never had to be balanced. The tires were so perfectly balanced. Um, uh, in for a long time, uh, late years of the plant, uh, the, the plant produced a carbonizable yarn, which was a rayon yarn of high strength and, and very critical uh, specifications but went into the space program. Now, our product was the, uh, became the raw material or the origin of the product that went on to other companies who, uh, who actually charred, uh, burned these yarns, and, but it left an intact ash, which became uh, the heart of a, uh, of a resin-coated operation, which then uh, went into uh, for the first years, heat tiles for re-entry of uh, space uh, craft and missiles so they wouldn't burn up. Uh, and then in the last few years, uh, these carbonizable yarns went into rocket nozzles for the big three-engine, um, can't think offhand of the, uh, the huge, but the most powerful rockets we had for going into space. Those nozzles, which were directable and movable, uh, were made uh, the raw material for those 
where yarn is made here in Front Royal. Uh, we also made textile yarns which went into very delicate uh, uh, things, even uh, before nylon became totally popular during after the war, uh, ladies' hosiery was made up from rayon, which is very sheer and, you know, fine. Uh, all the way to industrial yarns, uh, which went into uh, belts and conveyors and things like that. Uh, the, the, these yarns went into the textile industry and um, industrial fabrics and, and uh, cords and so on. They were, um, those were mostly made in box spinning, Fred Royal, Lewistown, and Parkersburg, West Virginia. And staple fiber, which was our cut fiber, um, it was designed for the particular end use, which I think I referred to once before, and, and they were, the design including the denier, which is the fineness, or the course is the fiber, the uh, staple length, how long they were, uh, the physical properties, the strength and the crimp and things like that. We made a regular staple, which was a straight fiber, essentially. We made various generations of crimp staple, which had the twist, uh, not the twist, but the curl in it, the little crimps. We made a regular crimp, high crimps, and, and, and eventually a super crimp. We made high weight modulus products, staple fiber, uh, two uh, levels of those, a fiber 40 and a fiber 410. Uh, for the many years, uh, rayon was always stronger than cotton dry, but when rayon was wet, it was not as strong as cotton. So through research and plant and a lot of work here at Downer Front Royal, we developed, uh, the company developed this, what we call a fiber 40, but it was a uh, high wet strength rayon fiber. And so this could go into all sorts of things, like outdoor, Fabrics, tents were made of it, uh, uh, tarpaulins, and and, uh, e and then even the finer deniers went into very fine uh, textile fabrics. And my wife has bought material of that and made garments and things from it. It was not only high strength; it was it, it had beautiful dyeing characteristics and so on. I'd mentioned flame retardant staple fibers before, and spun dyed staple fibers, where you know we could produce virtually any color that the customer wanted. And then high absorbency staple fibers that were, most of it probably used in the diaper industry to absorb moisture and lock it up. The acetate uh, uh, products which are all made in our Meadville, Pennsylvania plant. We made uh, acetate yarns uh, and, and, and colors and, and uh, both bright and, and dull. Um, and these were uh, for a delicate uh, old crepe fabrics and high fashion stuff that uh, uh, it was not as strong as regular rayon but it was uh, had such a beautiful hand and feel to it and so a lot of it went into very expensive fabrics and, and in fact I heard uh, Mr. Campbell mention it the, the lining in men's suits and probably women's suit coats too were all sailors acetate one time uh, because it was so slick and you, you, know, you put your coat on and it just slide on and off and no problem. But when we went out of business, there was only one producer left for a while and that was Tennessee Eastman. I'm not sure if they still produce acetate or not. Uh, also to show those acetates used for other things, ca uh, mo uh, uh, picture film, uh, you know, cameras, uh, oh, uh, screwdriver handles. We didn't make mold and stuff, but the same uh, resin is used to these clear screwdriver handles that you can almost see through. Those are all sailors' acetate. Uh, then, uh, in later years, both at uh, primarily here at Front Royal, we made a polyester staple fiber, which was getting into the new generation of fabrics. These were the, you know, no ironing required fabrics and things like that. So we probably all had polyester garments. We were in that business for a while, and then finally into the polypropylene staple fiber business here at Front Oil, which went into undergarments, diapers, sanitary products, and general textile use. So anyway, our company has been involved in all of these, plus we made strapping at uh, uh, for industrial strapping of boxes and cartons and things. And then, then uh, uh, I can't think of his name, I was a friend, who was a uh, researcher years back, had, had come up with these uh, micro crystalline cellulose 
And, and so the company built a plant in Dover, Delaware in the late 50s, I believe, maybe 60s, in which they commercially made this micro crystalline cellulose, which is like flour, and it was a food additive. And, and so uh, you could buy it, it was no calories because your body didn't digest the cellulose. And, and uh, so you could use it as an additive in cakes, cookies, and stuff. And there were some commercial products out with it for a while. And it was also, a, it gave added texture to ice cream. All the ice cream companies use it for a long time. But uh, anyway, so we've been associated with a lot of things that people uh, didn't realize. And, and I can remember one was uh, like a synthetic bacon and stuff like this. Now uh, this was uh, really just a developmental scale, but you, there was a bacon, bacon produced using this micro crystalline cellulose that tasted like bacon. It had a, almost the texture of bacon. I don't think it ever really caught on, but anyway, a lot of things that uh, were of interest, but uh, never really became large scale commercial. How did they get the grease in the thing? Uh, I, it didn't have grease. Uh, I I, uh, I was uh, uh, I used to work on trips, road trips, things with one of the fellows who, who was directly involved in that project. Uh, so I just remember that it did take place, but I, I don't know a whole lot about it. That's amazing. Is there anything else um, that you feel like you'd like to add at this point? <laughs> I, 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 uh, no, I don't think so. Well, yes. I, I will have to say, and I think others have said, that, that uh, I was always proud of our company and, and the people who worked in it. Uh, I, I believe we, we had some of the finest people anywhere, and, uh, and I've worked in five locations, and, uh, and our people were very similar in each one. And, uh, uh, I've known uh, people, professional people, from several other companies, and I don't believe that anybody uh, was happier with the people they worked with than I was. We weren't the highest paying company, but we, we had something of a family uh, thing there for so many years. Uh, I think we all felt we knew each other, and we were a team, we were working together, not for individual credit, and uh, it, it was a fine experience. Where were you when the plant closed? Could you talk a little bit about the closing? Yes. Um, well, uh, I was the plant manager at Parkersburg in the, its final year of operation, but I was moved out of there before it closed. It, uh, I was moved out in the summer of um, 1974, and the plant closed that fall. Um, I was at um, the nitro plant when it closed in uh, 1980 uh, and helped with the uh, preparations for the closure, run out and closure of the plant. And um, I was at Meadville in 1985 when that plant closed and the run out and the uh, uh, idling of that plant. And I was here at Front Royal when it closed abruptly in uh, 1989. And it was a sad thing in, in, uh, in every community because we had uh, a lot of employees and uh, a lot of loyal people, and it was a very difficult thing. Do you feel that Mary Sue Terry should have allowed more time for the proper closing, the run out? Do you do you feel that something was wrong there with pulling the plug, or well, was that I, okay? I, uh, no, I, I uh, don't know what to say there. Yeah. I, I was uh, not directly involved with Miss Terry about or anything, but. Uh, we had, all of our plants had always had a very good working ship, working relationship with state authorities, environmental companies, everywhere I was, and I personally got to know those environmental people. And we did have problems as the laws changed and became more strict, but in every case they would work with us because I knew we were trying and spending lots of money to try to overcome the problems we had. And the abrupt ending there uh, is, uh, something I don't really fully understand, but it did happen and that we were shut down quickly rather than an orderly run out and preservation of the plant as we always did before or in the other plant. Do you all uh, have any hopes and dreams for the future of the site of Abtex? Oh yes, I uh, I don't think, 
I don't think there will ever be another rayon plant built anywhere because it's too expensive. It's a long, uh, technical, technically complicated process, and I don't think it would ever be profitable. But uh, uh, it's encouraging to see uh, the interest in making something, returning something to this community here that's going on now, and that's why I'm willing to at least help a little bit I can to, you know, history or whatever else. But I think the, the, the plans that I'm aware of are very ambitious, and I just hope they come to be. The tape is running out. <laughs> <laughs> well, you've got way too much. You've got to edit that.